Hello everyone, welcome to Paleoecology video number four. So we spent the last three videos having looked at things at a relatively small scale in terms of ecospace. We were looking at species in a, in a thing called a niche. And over this video, we're going to be taking things to a slightly larger scale of environment. And we're going to be looking at things called environmental gradients. So in order to provide some context for you for that, one of the outcomes of this idea of niches, as we'll get onto at the end of this series of slides, is that the distribution of organisms, whether they are alive now or they are organisms we see fossilized in situ in the fossil record in a rock, those, um, that distribution follows predictable spatial patterns. So over the course of the coming slides, I wanted to unpack that a little bit and look at it in a bit more detail as we move from these small to big scales. So another way of saying what I just said is that the spatial distribution of organisms and their associations are controlled by um, processes we can put into basically three different forms, three camps. Those are physical processes, chemical processes, and biological processes. So those three kinds of processes control where we find organisms in the real world. And those, in turn, are often controlled by these things called gradients. I've put a definition of that on the slide for you here. An environmental gradient is a gradual and continuous change in communities and environmental conditions. Um, so one of those um, follows from the other one. The gradients can be related to environmental factors such as altitude, temperature, and moisture supply. So these are some really good examples. Within, say, the average ocean, we get quite a strong gradient as we go from um, shallow to deeper waters. Um, things will change, such as the amount of sunlight, also the temperature, as we move down along that gradient. In a contrasting example, as we climb up a mountain, um, we would see another change in um, factors such as the level of oxygen and the temperature. Those are examples of environmental gradients or gradual transitions across an environment. Gradients are quite common, though do bear in mind that there are environments where you can also get abrupt changes, which doesn't quite match our definition of gradient that I've just given you. But um, it's quite useful for us to think about gradients in this context. We can usually predict how species abundances change along an environmental gradient. That's not only determined by the abiotic factor, factors that I've mentioned, but also by the change in biotic interactions like competition along an environmental gradient. So with that in mind, let's look at the kind of different gradients that we can get. So once more, this is an exercise in just putting things into boxes to help us understand, as represented by stills, in this case, from the movie uh, Spirited Away. So we can say, if it's useful to us, that there are three primary kinds of gradient. The first of these we can call a resource gradient, as shown on the left here. These reflect an environmental variable that is consumed by the organisms, such as water and nutrients, or in this case, the feast that no face is about to consume. We can also um, put gradients into another categorization, another box, and we can call them direct gradients. These are gradients that reflect environmental variables that are not consumed by the organism, but that are directly um, linked to things that affect the physiology and growth of an organism, such as temperature and moisture in the case of terrestrial organisms. So in this case, we've got these little soot sprites taking coal to our... Um, to our um, furnace here, and these are in a uh, direct gradient of temperature, so things are hotter closer to this fire. Finally, there's such a thing as an indirect gradient. These are things that do not directly affect the physiology of organisms, but are tied to factors that do affect the physiology. So my previous examples in the last slide, such as elevation, the higher we go, um, would act as an indirect gradient because elevation in turn um, impacts on direct gradients such as temperature and oxygen levels and moisture, which all of which are strongly linked to elevation. So we can think of gradients in those three schools, resources, things consume, direct gradients, things that impact the physiology and growth of an organism, and then indirect gradients, which often control our direct gradients combined, these gradients define where organisms can live. So let's um, look now at those factors that do limit the distribution of life, both today and in deep time. 
Now, what factors along a gradient most strongly control organism distribution does depend what environment we're actually talking about. So let's choose to use marine ecosystems as an example, as demonstrated by this beautiful Roman mosaic. So we can place major controls that occur within marine ecosystems into three different classes. Uh, I recognize this video as lots of lists of threes and ways of defining things, but that's just what it is. I, I think they are nevertheless useful. So those three classes of controls in marine ecosystems are physical factors. Those include the temperature, the substrate consistency, the turbidity of water, the amount of sunlight there is, the, the amount of waves and current there is in the body of water, the frequency of disturbance of that water and water depth. Those are all physical factors that can control um, organism distribution in a, um, in a marine environment. The second class is chemical factors. That could include salinity, oxygen concentration, and nutrition concentrations or availability. And the third major class is biotic factors, including competition, predation, and herbivory. Those three classes of factors are the things we have to worry about that define the um, where we find organisms in a marine ecosystem. And of course, many of those factors are interrelated, such as sunlight and depth. The deeper you go in a body of water, the less sunlight you get. But obviously, all of those different factors impact our, um, to different degrees on where we find organisms. And I can tell you that within a marine ecosystem, it appears that water depth is the most important factor in marine communities at the large scale. That's an indirect gradient, and it leads to changes in light, nutrients, and temperature that are very much the primary controls of what, on what we find in any given um, marine ecosystem. After that, substrate consistency, so that's the consistency of the, the mud or rock on the seafloor, um, is often the next most important factor in open marine settings. As an example, variations between relatively soupy, soft, muddy substrates and firm, shelly to sandy ones have a significant impact on the organisms you find living on that seafloor. In intertidal settings, salinity is also a very important control on the biota that you find. And after these, salinity, oxygen, and nutrient concentrations, and also biotic controls impact um, on the pattern that you see. So that's a real world example of what impacts on where we find organisms along a gradient. And I've just told you that water depth is one of the most important ones. So it's worth finally thinking about why this works. Why am I able to tell you all of these interesting facts about where we find things in an ocean? Well, we can say um, these things, we can uh, kind of draw these conclusions because gradients and niches interact to limit the distribution of organisms. Because a niche is defined by physical, chemical, and biological factors, and those vary among environments and along gradients, species will only live in a specific region along a gradient. Even within a niche, Populations evolve strategies to maximize growth and reproduction across a specific range of environmental factors. And indeed, outside an individual's environmental optimum or tolerance range, its physiology and or its behavior may be negatively affected, reducing its overall fitness. As such, some ecologists have suggested that there is a bell curve, as shown on this graph, of species performance along a gradient. And this is shown as you can see here. If we imagine on the X axis here, an environmental gradient that could be the depth of water, or it could be the salinity, say, as you go from fresh to marine environments, it doesn't really matter what. And on the Y axis, we think about the fitness and possibly the abundance of any, the members of any given species. We could, um, kind of formulate this idea, we could theorize that maybe there is this bell-shaped curve whereby if you're in the optimal um, environmental conditions for your particular species, you may be thriving and reproducing as a species. But as you move away from that optimum, you may become suboptimal in that set of environmental conditions. There you would just be surviving, you may not be re reproducing that well. 
And at the very edge of your range, where you're just surviving, you're marginal, you may not even be able to reproduce at all. And so that is an idea that has sometimes been formalized into a thing called the abundant center hypothesis. This suggests that where species perform better, higher population densities are observed, and that those population densities decline towards the edge of a species range. That's a relatively well-established idea, but it's also much debated. Numerous studies point towards varied patterns of, it, of adherence to that idea. So this is a useful tool for us to think about how gradients and species interact, but actually the devil is in the details. There's lots of um, elements of this possible relationship that we haven't really nailed down. So I think it's a really interesting topic of research. That's just within one species. If we zoom out a tiny bit and then try to think again about um, communities of animals, it's further been posited that the exact relationships of organisms to gradients may fall into several groups when we're thinking about communities. This has largely played out in plant ecology, where researchers have tried to differentiate from each other several end members. So I thought I'd finish my video by introducing those end members, but bear in mind that all of this is quite theoretical and is actually um, quite hard to say for sure which pattern in the real world um, plants or anything else adheres to. So early in the history of paleoecology and the study of paleo communities, it was thought that communities were very tightly coupled to environments as shown on this graph here. So here once more we have our environmental gradient on the x-axis and on the y-axis we have the density of individuals. It's much like the graph that I showed you for a single species last time, but each one of these black lines represents one species and so we're looking at communities and what I mean is by um, the communities being tightly coupled is that in any given region within a gradient we tend to get one overlapping set of different species and that changes as you move along a gradient these things are in concert with each other they the the community is well tied together and they follow a similar range of, um, of space say down that environmental gradient um, so we get zonation of species is another way to say that. These are well-defined communities, and in this case, we've got nice sharp edges at the end here where the density of individuals dies off very quickly, and it, that is thought to represent boundaries that are sharpened by competitive exclusion, this idea that I introduced in the first video. An alternative to this is that there may be less strong coupling between the environmental gradient and the community that is living there. And in this case, you can see that because actually the different species ranges are less strongly overlapped, okay? So we don't get the same um, overlap of the different species in this graph here. Um, there are, you would see this as a, a lack of um, well-delineated bands uh, of different animal communities, say, as you go deeper into an ocean. But here, you still have competitive exclusion. You still have these sharp boundaries towards the edge of a species range, but without that tight linkage to gradients or biotic interactions, and therefore less apparent communities. However, we can also imagine a world where possibly we still have those tightly coupled communities, but we have less impact from competitive exclusion. So in this case, we've got those communities that exist at any given point along a gradient, but there are no sharp boundaries in the abundance. You can see these nice gentle curves that represent that lack of competitive exclusion. Um, so we have looser communities um, with longer tails in terms of density and, and abundance. And finally, Maybe we have a lower impact of environmental biotic interactions and less delineation of communities as a result. So here, um, what we're really looking at is that we've got um, a series of different species that occur down an environmental gradient, but competitive exclusion doesn't have much impact, and those aren't very tightly coupled. And empirical data from plant communities suggests that this figure here, the one that we're looking at, may be the most accurate in plants at least. But my personal view, and it is exactly that, um, is that in reality there is probably a mix depending on the ecosystems and gradients that you look at and your organisms of interest. But I think that it's fair to say that this is an area that requires a little bit more research. So there's lots of more interesting and exciting stuff to be found out in how environmental gradients and niches interact.
And that brings me to the end of video number four, so I'll see you shortly for video number five.